Chapter Title, The Queen's Conquest The winds howled outside the Red Keep, sending the banners of the Lannisters and Baratheons flapping violently against the stone walls. Inside, the Queen Regent, Cersei Lannister, sat in her chambers, surrounded by her loyal guardsmen and advisers. She was no longer the powerful queen she once was, stripped of her power and imprisoned for her crimes. But Cersei had a plan. She knew that her enemies were plotting against her, and she had to strike first if she wanted to survive. She called for Kyburn, her trusted ally and hand of the queen, to discuss her strategy. We must act quickly, Kyburn, she said pacing back and forth in her chambers. The Tyrells and the Sparrows are closing in on us. We need to strike first, before they can destroy us. Kyburn nodded. I have been working on something, my queen, he said, pulling out a small vial of clear liquid from his robes. This is a special poison that will kill instantly, without leaving a trace. We can use it to eliminate our enemies one by one. Cersei's eyes widened in excitement. Excellent work, Kyburn, she said, taking the vial from him. Now, we just need to find the right targets. Kyburn handed her a list of names, and Cersei scanned it quickly. She recognized many of the names as her enemies, including Marjorie Tyrell, the High Sparrow, and several members of the small council. Very well, she said, tucking the list into her sleeve. We strike tonight. The plan was simple. Cersei would send her guardsmen to eliminate each target, one by one, using the poison. They would move swiftly and silently, leaving no trace of their presence. And by morning, Cersei would be the only one left standing. As the night wore on, Cersei watched from her window as her guardsmen slipped out of the Red Keep and disappeared into the darkness. She felt a surge of excitement and fear, wondering if her plan would succeed. But as the hours ticked by, Cersei began to grow anxious. She had no way of knowing if her guardsmen were successful, or if they had been caught. And with each passing moment, she felt the weight of her actions growing heavier on her conscience. Finally, as the sun began to rise over King's Landing, a knock came at her door. Cersei's heart pounded as she rose to answer it, wondering if it was her doom at last. But to her surprise, it was Kyburn, looking pale and shaken. My queen, he said, his voice trembling. The guardsmen, they were caught. They are all dead. Cersei's heart sank. She knew that she had lost everything in that moment. Her power, her allies, her chance for survival. And as she sank to her knees, surrounded by the ruins of her dreams, Cersei Lannister wept. Chapter Title, The Prince of Winterfell The North was in chaos. The Boltons had taken control of Winterfell, and the Stark forces were scattered and defeated. But one man refused to give up. Theon Greyjoy, once the ward of the Starks and now a broken man, had escaped the clutches of Ramsay Bolton and was on the run. Theon knew that he had to find a way to help the Starks. He had betrayed them once, but he could not live with the guilt of his actions. He traveled north, through the snowy wilderness, until he came upon a small village of wildlings. There, he met a man named Torment Giant Spain, a warrior with a fierce reputation and a heart of gold. I need your help, Theon said, his voice shaking. The Boltons have taken Winterfell, and I need to find a way to help the Starks. Tormund looked at him skeptically. Why should we help you, he asked, his eyes narrowing. Because I can help you too, Theon said, desperation creeping into his voice. The Boltons are not just a threat to the Starks. They are a threat to all of us. They will stop at nothing to gain power and control over the North. We need to unite and fight back. Tormund considered his words for a moment before nodding. Very well, he said. We will help you. But first, 
you must prove yourself to us. Thien knew what he had to do. He would have to fight for the wildlings, to show them that he was worthy of their trust. And so, he joined them in battle, wielding his sword with all the skill he had learned from the Starks. The fight was brutal and bloody, but in the end, the wildlings emerged victorious. They cheered as Thien stood, bloodied and battered but alive. You have earned our trust, Tormund said, clapping him on the back. We will help you. Together, Thien and the wildlings set out to retake Winterfell. They traveled through the snow-covered hills, dodging Bolton patrols and hiding in the shadows. And finally, they arrived at the gates of the castle. Thien led the charge, his sword flashing in the dim light of the torches. The Boltons fought back fiercely, but they were no match for the determined forces of the wildlings. And in the end, they emerged victorious, with Thien standing in the courtyard of Winterfell, his sword raised high. But even as he celebrated his victory, Thien knew that his journey was far from over. He had helped the Starks retake their home, but there were still many battles to be fought. And he was ready for them. The Prince of Winterfell had returned, and he would not rest until the North was free once more. Chapter Title, The Battle of Mirian Daenerys Targaryen stood on the walls of Mirian, watching as the Slave Master's armies gathered on the horizon. She knew that this battle would be the most important of her life. If she lost, all her work to free the slaves and establish a just rule in Mirian would be for nothing. The army of Mirian was outnumbered, but Daenerys refused to give up. She had her Unsullied, her Dothraki, and her dragons. And she had a plan. As the Slave Master's armies advanced, Daenerys ordered her forces to fall back. The enemy pursued them, thinking they had the upper hand. But then, out of nowhere, Drogon appeared. The dragon soared over the battlefield, breathing fire and striking fear into the hearts of the Slave Master's armies. They scattered, trying to avoid the flames, but it was too late. The dragon's fury was unstoppable. Daenerys seized the opportunity and led her forces in a charge. The Unsullied formed a shield wall, while the Dothraki rode around the flanks. They clashed with the enemy, swords ringing and blood spilling. Daenerys fought with all her might, wielding a dragon bone tipped spear with deadly accuracy. She had never felt so alive so powerful. She was the mother of dragons, and she would not be defeated. But as the battle raged on, Daenerys saw that victory was slipping away. The slave masters had brought more soldiers than she had anticipated, and they were well trained and well armed. They began to overwhelm her forces, pushing them back towards the city. Daenerys knew that this was her last chance. She called out to her dragons, commanding them to unleash their full power. Drogon, Rhaegal, and Vice Ryan took to the skies, their wings blocking out the sun. They breathed fire and ice, scorching the earth and freezing the enemy. The slave master's armies were decimated. They retreated in disarray, leaving their dead and wounded behind. Daenerys had won. As the sun set over the battlefield, Daenerys surveyed the destruction. She had won the battle, but at what cost? The losses had been high, and the city was in ruins. But she knew that she had done the right thing. She had fought for freedom and justice, and she. Network Error Chapter Title the Siege of Mirian, continued. Daenerys Targaryen stood atop the walls of Mirian, watching as the armies of Yunkai and Astapur marched toward her city. She had ordered her armies to meet them on the battlefield, but her advisors were cautioning against it, warning of the dangers of an open conflict. As they debated their next move, a messenger arrived with news from the Grey Joys. They had pledged their allegiance to Daenerys and were sailing to Mirian to offer their aid. Daenerys knew that this was a crucial moment in her fight for the Iron Throne. She needed to make a bold move to show her strength and inspire loyalty in her followers. She turned to her advisors and said, We will not wait for them to attack us. We will take the fight to them. With that, she mounted her dragon, Drogon, and took to the skies. Her armies followed her lead, charging out of the gates of Mirian and meeting the enemy armies head on. In the chaos of battle, Daenerys fought fiercely, her dragon's flames scorching the enemy lines. She saw her unsullied holding their ground and her Dothraki riders circling the enemy's flanks. She knew that victory was within reach. As the last of the enemy soldiers fell, Daenerys looked out across the battlefield, her heart filled with a sense of triumph. She had won a great victory, and her enemies had been humbled. But she knew that there would be more battles to come, and that the road to the Iron Throne would be long and treacherous. She turned to her advisors and said, We must continue to fight, to show the world that we are worthy of ruling the Seven Kingdoms. And with that, Daenerys Targaryen, the mother of dragons, prepared for the next stage of her journey. Chapter Title, 
the Winterfell Conspiracy. The halls of Winterfell were filled with whispers and secrets. Lord Wyman Manderley had arrived, along with a host of knights and soldiers, and there were rumors of a conspiracy to overthrow the Boltons and restore House Stark to power. Sansa Stark, still disguised as Elaine Stone, was in the midst of it all. She had been summoned to a secret meeting by Lord Manderley, who revealed his plan to her. He had been working behind the scenes to gather support for a new rebellion, and he needed Sansa's help to rally the people of the North to their cause. Sansa was hesitant at first. She had been living in fear of being discovered by the Boltons and feared for her safety. But Lord Manderley assured her that she was safer with him than with anyone else in Winterfell. The plan was risky, but Lord Manderley had a strategy. He would use his resources to support a new claimant to the Iron Throne, one who had the support of the North. They would work together to overthrow the Boltons and install a new ruler in Winterfell. As the meeting came to a close, Sansa couldn't help but feel hopeful. She had been living in fear and uncertainty since her family's downfall, but now she saw a glimmer of hope. She knew that there was still a chance to restore her family's legacy and take revenge against those who had wronged them. But she also knew that the road ahead would be long and difficult. The Boltons were not easily defeated, and there were still many in the North who remained loyal to them. Nevertheless, Sansa vowed to do everything in her power to see Lord Manderley's plan through. As she left the meeting, Sansa realized that she was no longer alone. She had allies now, powerful allies who were willing to risk everything for the sake of their cause. And with that realization, she felt a renewed sense of purpose and determination. The Winterfell Conspiracy had begun, and Sansa was at the heart of it. Chapter Title, The Dragon's Fury Daenerys Targaryen stood atop the walls of Meereen, watching as her armies clashed against the forces of Yunkai. The battle had been raging for hours, and it seemed as though the fighting would never end. Daenerys had been forced to make difficult decisions in the lead-up to the battle. She had ordered her dragons to burn the ships of Yunkai, knowing that it would kill countless soldiers and civilians. It was a brutal move, but Daenerys knew that she needed to show her enemies that she was not to be trifled with. As the battle raged on, Daenerys saw her armies begin to falter. The soldiers of Yunkai were fierce and well-trained, and they seemed to be gaining the upper hand. Daenerys knew that she needed to take action, and she did not hesitate. With a fierce cry, Daenerys mounted her dragon, Drogon, and soared into the sky. She could feel the heat of his flames on her face as she unleashed a torrent of fire upon the armies below. The soldiers of Yunkai scattered, screaming in terror as they were engulfed in flames. Daenerys knew that she had to act quickly. She guided Drogon down to the ground, where she could see the enemy commanders rallying their troops. With a fierce determination, she charged forward, her sword raised high. The fighting was fierce, but Daenerys was fueled by a fury that she had never felt before. She had come too far to be defeated now, and she knew that her enemies would pay dearly for their insolence. The battle raged on for what felt like hours, but in the end, it was Daenerys and her armies who emerged victorious. The soldiers of Yunkai were defeated, and the city lay in ruins. But Daenerys knew that the cost of victory had been high. As she stood among the rubble of the city, Daenerys felt a sense of sorrow and regret. She had done what she had to do to win the battle, but she knew that her actions had caused untold suffering and death. She vowed to herself that she would be more careful in the future, that she would find a way to win her wars without resorting to such brutal tactics. But for now, Daenerys could only stand and watch as the smoke rose from the ruins of Meereen. She had won the battle, but she knew that the war was far from over. The road ahead was long and difficult, and Daenerys knew that she would need all the strength and courage she could muster to see it through. Chapter 6, The Inn The salt spray stung Theon's eyes as he clung to the mast of the Iron Victory, staring out at the roiling grey waters of the narrow sea. The sails were taut, and the wind was fierce, driving the longship forward with reckless abandon. The crew shouted and sang, reveling in the thrill of the storm. But Theon felt only fear. He had never been a sailor, and the wild seas terrified him. And yet here he was, sailing eastward to a land he had never seen, with only a few ironborn for company. He had no idea what awaited him in Essos, no plan for what he would do when he arrived. All he knew was that he could never go back to the north, not after what he had done. Theon closed his eyes and tried to steady his breathing, to calm his racing heart. He had been a captive of the Boltons for so long, had endured so much pain and humiliation, that he had almost forgotten what it felt like to be free. But now he was free, or as free as a man like him could ever be. And yet he felt no relief, no joy. Only a deep and abiding sense of guilt. He had betrayed the Starks, had murdered their boys and burned their castle. And for what? To win his father's love, to prove himself a true ironborn. But it had all been for nothing. His father was dead, his sister lost, and he was a broken, wretched thing. 
Thean opened his eyes and looked out at the sea again. The storm was growing stronger, and the waves were beginning to crest and crash around the ship. But he didn't care. Let the sea take him, let it drown him. He deserved no less. But then he saw something in the distance, a faint flicker of light amidst the darkness. He squinted, trying to make out what it was, and then he saw it, a beacon, a lighthouse on a rocky shore. Thean felt a glimmer of hope, a spark of something he thought had died long ago. He clung to the mast and watched as the ship drew closer to the shore, to the light. And for the first time in a long time, he dared to imagine a future beyond his guilt and shame. Maybe, just maybe, he could find a way to make amends for what he had done. Maybe he could find a new purpose, a new path. Maybe he could find redemption. Thean smiled, a small, fragile thing, and whispered a prayer to the drowned god. He didn't know what the future held, but he knew that he would face it head on, with courage and determination. For the first time in a long time, Thean Greyjoy felt alive. Chapter 7 The Prince's Plan Doran Martell sat alone in his solar, staring out at the gardens of Sun's Pier. The news of Daenerys Targaryen's arrival in Westeros had reached him, and he knew he needed to act quickly. He had waited for this moment for years, ever since he had sent his son, Quentin, to seek her out in Essos. Quentin had failed, but Doran had not given up hope. He called for his daughter, Arianne, and his loyal captain of the guard, Ario Hotat, to join him. They entered the room, bowing their heads respectfully. Dorne must be ready to support the Dragon Queen, Doran declared. We cannot let this opportunity slip away. Arianne looked at her father skeptically. How do you propose we do that? Our armies are small, and the Iron Throne will never accept us as allies. Doran smiled wryly. We must be clever, my daughter. The Iron Throne may not accept us as allies, but perhaps they will accept a marriage proposal. Ario Hota spoke up. To whom would you propose such a marriage, my prince? To Prince Tristana, of course, Doran replied. He is of an age with the Dragon Queen, and he is a good and loyal boy. He will make a fine husband for her. Ariane frowned. But what of Marcella? She is betrothed to Tristana, and the Lannisters will not take kindly to us breaking that betrothal. Duran's expression grew serious. Marcella is in danger here. The Lannisters will come for her, and we cannot protect her. But if she is sent to King's Landing as Tristana's bride, she will have the protection of the Iron Throne. And if Tristana is wed to Daenerys Targaryen, then Dorne will have the protection of the Dragon Queen. Ario Hota nodded his agreement. It is a risky plan, my prince, but it may be our best chance to secure Dorne's future. Doran smiled, pleased with their support. We will send word to King's Landing at once. And we will pray that the Dragon Queen sees the wisdom in our proposal. Chapter, The Red Woman As the moon rose high in the sky, Melisandre walked out of the castle gates and into the darkness beyond. The wind was howling and the snow was falling, but she felt no cold. She was lost in thought, wondering about the visions she had seen in the flames. The Lord of Light was speaking to her, she was sure of it, but his words were cryptic and his will unclear. Suddenly, she heard a faint sound, like someone was approaching from the distance. She turned around, and saw a small figure, wrapped in furs, walking towards her. It was a child, a girl of no more than eight or nine years old, with dark hair and bright blue eyes. Who are you? Melisandra asked, surprised to see a child out in the middle of the night. The girl looked up at her with a solemn expression. I am Willa, she said. 
I have been sent to you by my lady. Your lady? Melisandra asked, intrigued. The lady Ston Ehart, the girl replied. She bids you come to her, in the woods beyond the river. Melisandra hesitated for a moment. She had heard of the Lady Stan Ehart, the resurrected Catalan Stark, who was said to be leading a group of outlaws in the Riverlands. She had not expected to encounter her here, in the far north. Very well, Melisandra said. Lead the way. The two of them set off through the snow-covered woods, the child leading and Melisandra following. As they walked, Melisandra began to feel a growing sense of unease. There was something unnatural about this child, something that made her skin crawl. After a while, they came to a clearing in the woods, where a group of people were waiting. At their center was a figure wrapped in a cloak, with a hood pulled low over her face. Melisandra knew at once that this was the Lady Stan Ehart. Melisandra, the Lady Stan Ehart said in a voice that was barely more than a whisper. I have need of your services. What can I do for you, my lady? Melisandra asked, trying to keep the fear out of her voice. The Lady Stan Ehart drew back her hood, revealing a face that was ravaged by wounds and decay. Her eyes were filled with an otherworldly fire, and Melisandra could feel the power emanating from her. I have a task for you, the Lady Stan Ehart said. A task that only you can accomplish. What is it? Melisandra asked, her heart pounding. I need you to bring me back my daughter, the Lady Stan Ehart said. I need you to resurrect her. Melisandra felt a chill run down her spine. She had heard of such things, of course, but she had never attempted it herself. The magic was dark and dangerous, and the consequences could be dire. I will do what I can, my lady, she said, her voice trembling. Good, the Lady Stan Ehart said. Then we have an understanding. Melisandra nodded and the Lady Stan Ehart turned and walked away, disappearing into the shadows of the woods. Melisandra stood there for a moment, feeling the weight of the task that had been given to her. She knew that the road ahead would be perilous, but she also knew that she had no choice but to follow it. The Lord of Light had spoken, and she was his chosen servant. Chapter 9, The Prince of Dorne Elaria Sand had waited long enough, she had watched her lover, Oberyn Martell, die in a duel against the mountain, and then she had watched as her daughters were murdered by Cersei Lannister. She could take no more. Elaria had rallied the remaining Sand Snakes, and they had taken control of Sun's Pair. She knew that they needed allies if they were going to have any chance of defeating the Lannisters and avenging Oberyn and their daughters. Elaria summoned the Prince of Dorne, Dorian Martell, to a meeting in the Water Gardens. Dorian was hesitant to meet with her but Elaria was not going to take no for an answer. When Dorian arrived, Elaria wasted no time in laying out her plan. She proposed that they ally with Daenerys Targaryen, who was now sailing towards West Eros with an army of Unsullied and Dothraki. Dorian was skeptical. He had always been cautious and had preferred to wait and watch rather than take action. But Elaria was persuasive, and she argued that they had nothing left to lose. Doran finally agreed to send envoys to Daenerys and offer her an alliance. He knew that they needed to act quickly if they were going to have any chance of success. As the meeting ended, Elaria couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. She had finally taken action, and she knew that they were one step closer to avenging Oberyn and their daughters. But she also knew that the road ahead would be long and difficult. Chapter 10, Griff John Connington watched as the Golden Company made its way through the mist. The sun had yet to rise and the air was thick with the scent of salt and seaweed. The sounds of waves crashing against the shore echoed in the distance, a reminder of their journey across the narrow sea. He had dreamed of this moment for years, ever since he learned of the boy's existence. Aegon Targaryen, the true heir to the Iron Throne, was finally here, in the flesh. Jon had devoted his life to the boy's cause, even at the cost of his own honor and reputation. 
Aegon had been quiet during the journey, his thoughts hidden behind a mask of stoicism. John knew the weight of the boy's burden, the expectations of his ancestors and the people he was destined to rule. But John also knew the boy's potential, the spark of Targaryen fire that burned within him. As they rode towards the castle of Storm's End, John's mind drifted to the past. He remembered the last time he had been here, during Robert's rebellion. He had been tasked with defending the castle against the Baratheon forces, but he had failed. Robert had taken the castle and sent John into exile, a broken man with nothing left to live for. But now, with Aegon by his side, John felt a sense of purpose once again. He would do everything in his power to ensure that the boy sat on the Iron Throne, to reclaim what was rightfully his. He would not let history repeat itself. The gates of Storm's End opened, revealing the imposing figure of Ser Bari Stan Selmy, the former Lord Commander of the King's Guard. John dismounted his horse and walked towards the old knight, a mix of respect and bitterness filling his heart. Lord Connington, Ser Bari Stan greeted him with a nod. Ser Bari Stan, John replied, his voice steady. Is everything ready for our arrival? Everything is in place, the knight confirmed. We await your orders. John nodded and turned towards Aegon, who had dismounted his horse as well. The boy looked up at him, his violet eyes shining with determination. It's time, Aegon said, his voice soft but firm. John felt a surge of pride as he looked at the boy. He was not just a Targaryen, he was a leader, a king in the making. John knew that the road ahead would be treacherous and full of obstacles, but with Aegon by his side, he was ready to face anything. Together, they walked towards the castle, ready to claim what was rightfully theirs.